Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Talking Cardboard. As always, I'm the cool one and Jerch, well, he tries. Uh, on today's video, we are reviewing the brand new game called Brian Baru. Let's get started. All right, everybody, and thank you for joining us. As always, if you like the content you see here on the channel, consider subscribing. We really do appreciate it. Like the video, comment below. We definitely like to hear your thoughts on the games as well. So getting right into Brian Baru, let's dive down to the table here, take a look at all the components, and we'll go over a brief gameplay of how Brian Baru is played. It's a it's an interesting one, right, Jerch? I, there's it looks like there's a lot going on, but really there's not a ton going on. It's more of uh, kind of a twist on trick taking mixed with some area control in various ways. Yeah, I love the trick taking style of this game. That is the 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 basic aspect of it is everybody is dealt out cards, and there are different suits. I mean, I can pull them out here and, and kind of show them on screen and then up on our alternative is we have three equal suits we've got blue yellow and red and then depending on which zone you are going after oh excuse me i forgot the the wild the wild suit depending on which zone you're going after which is signified by this pink ring that determines what suit is trump and then i love that aspect of you've got trump and if you follow that suit then the highest value of that suit takes the trick gets the territory the primary rewards with it and then everybody else regardless of if your number is even higher if it wasn't in that trump suit or it wasn't a wild then you get a secondary reward and mm -hmm. i like the strategy that goes with the trick taking game i also really like in this game that taking the tricks is not the objective yeah that the the cards and the the tricks are just the um, engine behind how you are finding all these different ways to win, uh, all these different ways to get resources to yeah. further along your goals to try to to win this game. Yeah, and like I said when we uh, first dove into this video here, is that it, it is a twist on trick taking. It's not true trick taking. Like George said with this pink ring here, only the active player needs to follow which suit they're they're choosing. So mm -hmm. whether it be the yellow, blue, or red suit, that is the suit they must lead with. But nobody else around the table has to follow in suit. Uh, sure, if you want to try the to win the suit, uh, let's take a card for an example here. If you want to try to win the suit to get the top reward on the card, then then yes, you do need to follow in suit. Otherwise, if you want one of the bottom rewards, usually there's at least two options. You don't have to follow at all. You can just, uh, you can try to lose the trick intentionally to get a couple of the rewards at the bottom. And we've found that Sure, the, the winning the suit reward or winning the trick reward is great at trying to overtake these different regions, mm -hmm. but the effects at the bottom of each card by losing the trick are, are just viable strategies, are just as good viable strategies as well. Yes. That the, it is very dynamic in terms of the ways that you can be uh, maximizing each trick in each round. Uh, and you've got other tracks, like for example, here with the red suit, is that is more of like the military theme. So an option you could be taking would be uh, acquiring Vikings for a possible impending invasion from uh, barbarians that could, you know, maybe take over territories as signified by these little shields. And that's bad. If you lose a territory, it's really bad because then it, it hurts different ways you can be scoring points. With yellow, that is more of the marriage track, which mm -hmm. is over here on the side. I think that's really uh, kind of a, a cute twist and it's kind of a, a politics type of way where at the end of each round, whoever is highest on the marriage track gets to marry whichever uh, character is here and then you get the rewards on the bottom. Yep. So I like that that is kind of a, a political kind of struggle a little bit to be the highest one up on that track. Mm -hmm. And then finally with the, the blue is that's kind of the religious over here where it's scoring different ways to be adding monasteries, which is buffing up the value of your cities. So, yeah. Um, a lot of different moving components here, but everything is laid out very clearly, very succinctly. And the, the order that things happen in the order of operations also plays into the game in terms of you do the marriage track first, then you're checking military. Yep. And then working your way over to the, the religious side of it. So it, it all plays really well together. Yeah, and I'd have to say that flows right into my first pro for the game too, is that the way the tracks work is really smartly done. Whoever wins on each of the tracks, they're basically uh, sacrificing everything they've worked toward just to get that benefit. But everybody else who, who ended up below the first player gets to keep um, some of their progress that they made that turn prior 
um, on that track. So it's not that like they're losing everything and starting back from square zero or square one in the mm -hmm. next turn. They've already got a leg up in, during the next round, which is really neat. But that person who did win it gets a great benefit out of it. Like as you can kind of see here, winning the, uh, not the favor, but marrying the person at the top here, it can gain you some control in some of these regions. And that mm -hmm. can be integral to, to some large, large victory points at the end of the game. Um, and also giving you some just inherent victory points as well. Uh, but some of the other rewards too, it might gain you access to a couple coins, or I forget what these are called, but uh, like the sun tokens that can help you toward the military later on. So with the cards, losing is not necessarily a bad thing. And with the tracks as well, losing is not necessarily a bad thing. You don't want to lose every time, Yes, but it's not a bad thing to lose once in a while. It's a, a very dynamic kind of um, trick taking where there are a bunch of routes to success and to progressing your, your strategy. Uh, I do like that you don't have to win in any one of these particular regions uh, in order to reap some sort of benefit. Mm -hmm. That second place is getting um, a victory point and then giving some of their um, Vikings back. Or uh, I guess that's the same idea on this on the religious track as well, where it's not just limited to either your first or it was a waste of your time and resources. Mm -hmm. So that that's a really good pro and it um, makes it seem like that there's no really w wrong way to go about this. No. Because yeah. even if you don't finish in first, and especially when it's on this marriage track, if you get leapfrogged right at the end, which happened a bunch of times, yeah. you're still not out of luck. Like no. you're still getting coins, which we found at least in the playthroughs that we've done to be very, very valuable. Uh, that that is probably the hottest commodity yeah. is money. <laughs> there's not this. very many of it either. No. So. So that that's the hottest commodity where sometimes you might not even want to be winning on that marriage track in order to be getting those residuals. And that brings me to one of my top pros on this is when it comes to the, the cards themselves is you've got options for what you can do. You can either, as you're acquiring the cards, because at the start of every round, the cards are dealt back out and it's kind of a card drafting. So you're building your hand, which I really like. Yeah. And then you're able to craft the strategy you want to do that round. Do you want to be going for these high value cards to try to be winning the trick, but then it's going to cost you coins in order to buy the territory? Yeah. Or if you want to be kind of scuttling your, your round to try to be getting more resources, like yeah. that five there, yeah, is you're probably not going to win with a five. That's a really low number. Mm -hmm. uh, but then you've got better resources and it's helping you craft your strategy and, and then trying to get some of the wilds as well, when to add those to your hand or not. Uh, I really like the hand building because it's not really a crafting so much because it's the same cards and they get redealt each round. Yep. But it's building your hand and then the trick taking kind of push and pull in that. I really like that aspect of it. And they're all numbered one through 25. So it's, you don't have to remember which suit uh, or like a wild trumping, like the regular suit or vice versa. It's mm -hmm. just a one through 25. It doesn't really matter. It's really cool how the wild cards take on the role of being the color of the current suit as well. So it's very easy to remember that sort of role yes. in the game. Another pro that I really like is that you can't just hop around to these different regions unless you are in control of this, mm -hmm. unless you are the, the active player. If you do win control, you can hop around on roads that you have control over, which is really cool. You can just extend your path. It's kind of hard to see, I think, here on camera, but extend your path along the road. So if you do want to jump around to different regions or these little like uh, satellite locations on the board, you need to eventually win a trick once in a while to take control of being the active player. And I think that flies in the face of a lot of other area control games that we know before, most notably like Risk, where the only routes that you can take are direct roads. So you want to be building a like sprawling geographic path. Uh, but here that's actually more expensive because uh, as you can see on the, the cards, uh, this little icon means in order to be acquiring a new city, you have to pay five gold. I don't know if you can see the five on that, but mm -hmm. um, if you're not winning the, the trick, which usually costs you money, then you could be paying a lot of money to be building uh, along your path. And then that kind of hamstrings you or tightens you in. So it's, it's a push and pull in terms of that. Mm -hmm. Are you going to create satellite like um, by winning a bunch of the tricks, but then you got to make sure you got the money for it. Yeah. And uh, like, that's really good too. And I have to break my brain from that thinking of, I need to create a road yeah. or a path, or, you know, I need to start in some centralized location where I can then work really closely to other ones where that is a viable strategy of winning where it's located, you know, mm -hmm. and then hopping around, but you have to hold serve. Yeah. 
only the person who wins the trick gets to decide where the next location we fight over is. Yeah, yeah. And some of these roads just loop in the, within the same region by itself. Some of the roads extend into other regions. So you can mm -hmm. kind of creep your way into other regions kind of more silently and, and to try to sneak up on people. So that's cool too. And I did notice during our few gameplays of this that there is some blocking going on, or at least I was trying to block, yeah. where you are strategically placing tokens on various roads in certain locations within that road to make it more difficult for other people to spread their their locations too based on the colors that you have in your yeah. hand and that that brings me to um one of my uh, it's another one of my pros i think is um there's different ways to be maximizing your area control for this because in each of these regions they have a victory points if you have the majority power there and this these are how many settlements or, or cities need to be founded in order for that to start to trigger yeah so uh it's kind of a push and pull on do you try to flood this to take control early or are you going to kind of slowly meander and then maybe strike at the end yeah so then other people can't take it away from you yeah. uh some of these larger ones like munster or cano or cannot mm -hmm. uh where there's a lot of territories that got to be involved is then you know it's kind of a family pot where there's a lot of people involved in it and it's kind of a dance you're kind of going back and forth holding back you know uh and re-entering in some instances instances and like you said by the end of the game you want to take that final strike to take it over and that can be tough too, because whoever's willing are winning this military can put these tokens on yes. top and block other people, and that uh, that just plays so well into it. It just feels so nice and smooth in the way all the mechanisms work together. Yeah, it, it's uh, a lot of it is like you said, really smooth. Mm -hmm. um, but then that kind of leads me to one of my cons is uh, trying to figure out the resources uh, and especially the money. Uh, that there's a lot of, of the, the one coins, and then there's a whole stack of five coins, mm -hmm. you know, five value coins. And at no point did any of us have more than, say, five or six coins. Yeah. So, like, were we not doing it right? We were always strapped for cash, which maybe that is a part of it because the game was still successful. Yeah. However we were doing it. Um, but if we were doing something wrong in not, like, maximizing our income to try to be earning money... Uh, that it felt like we were always strapped for cash and that there was a lot of extra uh, money that wasn't really going to any use. Yeah. Uh, so I kind of felt that that was a, a bit of a you know, a con or detractor for me is that was such a limiting resource. And that could vary based on player count too. We've only really played it at four player, yeah. um, but it goes, it scales from three to five players. So, you know, I don't know. I like the tightness in a game though. I definitely do like the tight money, the hard decisions, and this game definitely provides that. But like George said, there is there is some additional tokens that we didn't use um, or the money tokens throughout the games where it kind of leads us to believe were we playing it correctly or... I don't know, maybe we we're all playing it uh, suboptimal not, yeah, suboptimally. Yeah, exactly. So it kind of, uh, it lends itself to more plays to see what really takes place here. But then that's just more avenues for trying to have victory or, or success or different strategies. Do you want to go a heavy like military strategy where you're the one always in control of getting the, the residual honor to be able to get more victory points where those stack and then possibly, if not enough, of the Vikings are taken, start to lock down other people's settlements where they no longer have control. So there's a bunch of different strategies that we've only scratched the surface on. Yeah, yeah. And, and not to knock on the game too much, because I really did enjoy most of the game, but I guess my biggest con, as we're talking about it here, is that it doesn't feel like a traditional trick-taking game, so it's kind of hard to find a definite strategy in this game, at yeah. least for the first few plays that we've played. Uh, because in, in normal trick-taking games, you can try to suss out, uh, you know, who has what cards in their hand or try to, uh, is that kind of the right to, term for to, it? To either like short suits so then you can start to play your wilds, yeah. uh, to dictate, to pull out everybody else's trump if I wanted to try to win on a low card that I would try to pull out everybody else's trump. Yeah, that was a um, initially a big disappointment for me as well, who mm -hmm. has a, uh, somebody who has a lot of experience in trick-taking games like 500 and Euchre. Uh, and things like that where I was initially going in with, oh, I, I know how to, you know, handcraft and try to manipulate to to win with these lower ones. Yep. Uh, but then after, I think, halfway through the first game, I just suspended that um, desire. Mm -hmm. And it, it didn't make, it didn't negatively impact this game for me at all. It just changed what the game meant to me. Yeah. 
Yeah, it, it definitely it holds its own place in the world or in the realm of board games. It's not just another trick-taking game. Yeah. But it could be a con for some people getting into it thinking, oh, trick-taking mixed with area control. No, it's not It's not your typical trick-taking. Uh, so that could be a con if you're thinking that it you're not getting what you expect. Yes, and, and you know, that then it just, like I said, it just changes what this game means. I do like that it did make a, an attempt at trick-taking, but also give the freedom of, if you are not familiar with that, play style or that thought process yeah. that you are not at a disadvantage true yes that's very true like i said uh halfway through the first playthrough i had to suspend my um desire to make this a true trick-taking game and uh it just changed what this game meant to me so uh i like that it's area control i like how dynamic it is how you can craft your hand how you can craft your strategies as you're going through uh, i would say that this is like um a seven and a half right now but I think it could, with more playthroughs and more understanding of the strategies and how to best use my hand, uh, hand of cards, I know how to use these, uh, <laughs> I think it could go all the way up to like a nine. Yeah. Uh, I really enjoy playing this, and I hope we bring it out to the table a lot more. Mm -hmm. But just you know, having to recalibrate what type of game this is uh, and then kind of diving in and learning new strategies, is that's kind of where I'm at as like a seven and a half right now. Yeah, yeah, and I'm going to be a little bit higher, um, but the game for me, I was expecting more of the trick-taking with the area control, but mm -hmm. I think me coming not from as much of a trick-taking background, I think I liked it and enjoyed it a lot more than I thought I would. Yeah. I think coming in, I was probably thinking it would probably be about a seven, seven and a half for me, but I'm going to give it an eight and a half out nice. of ten because it just surprised me that much. It just, it was... It was one of those games that it just it played smooth. It played really quickly. It felt yes. like it didn't take much time at all. Um, and it gave a lot of meat on the bones, too. Uh, only 25 cards to deal with. You're dealing it out uh, to, you know, to each player each round. And it's the, the card drafting is always a mechanism I really enjoy. Mm -hmm. So trying to um, develop your or change up your strategy each round differently based on the cards you start with or the cards that are passed to you was a lot of fun. And that mixed with area control and the new things that this game brought as a, a complete package just surprised the heck out of me. So eight and a half for me. Could go up with more plays. Yeah. Could go down, but I, I could I could see it going up for sure. Yeah, and, and especially as we get this to a larger group of our talking cardboard, then different people will bring their different experiences and, and ways that they will approach the hand drafting yeah. uh, and then the area control of it. And I think it would be really fun. And yeah, yeah it's going to be one of those games that it was pretty quick to, to play through once we learned how everything worked. And Yeah, and it... Uh, I guess kind of off topic a little bit, but I'm just thinking of how they could expand upon this game with an expansion, uh, or if it's even needed, because it's so elegant and smooth and simple and quick to play as is. But um, yeah, it's just one of those games that I, I hope doesn't get old for me. I hope it doesn't get stale because uh, I have fun each time. And I think it'll be new and refreshing and fun every time we bring it to the table with new players, showing people who haven't played it before. But I hope it also has that staying power for us as a group uh, who have played it you know, 10, 11, 12 times. Yeah, I, I just hope it has that mainstay. I can see it with the same cards resurfacing over and over again. I could see it getting a little stale, but I, I, I hope not. Yeah. But we'll see. But until next time, that is our review of Brian Baru. I hope you all enjoyed. And until next time, you all have fun gaming.